Hello, welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this show, which is designed to give all of us a little more insight into what goes on in and around our state capital here in Salem. Our guests today are two folks who have been heavily involved in fighting crime throughout our society here in the state of Oregon, especially as advocates in the legislative process. Bob and Dee Dee Coons from Crime Victims United. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Bob, you and Dee Dee make up pretty much a team here, and one of the things we like to do here, and of course your husband and wife, which is another reason why you make up a good team, one of the things we like to do here is to try to get a little background information on where folks are from, uh, what their upbringing was like, just so we can make it a little more personal for people to understand the background on, on the guests on the show. And we'll have ladies first here, actually, would uh, Dee Dee, if you could tell us a little bit about where you're from and growing up and that sort of thing. I grew up in Corvallis. And Bob grew up in Albany, and we've lived in Portland now for about 25 years, 27, I guess. Time flies. And uh, our daughter was murdered in 1980, and we uh, formed Crime Victims United in 1983. And since that time, we've been working on many, many um, victim-related law enforcement, um, prison, jail issues. Well, let me take you back to before your, your daughter's murder and ask you a little bit about what, what your work or home lives were like, what it was like before this tragedy occurred. Uh, Bob, perhaps you could fill us in a bit. Well, uh, I was in the grain business a good share of my life. I ran country elevators, barge houses, this sort of thing. I was a grain trader. Um, we also um, got into small business, and uh, at, at, in fact, at the time of Valerie's death, we had a business up in Sunnyside, Washington, a door and window, uh, replacement door and windows, storm windows, security storm doors, that, that sort of thing. And uh, of course, when that tremendous tragedy hit us, why our life took a real change in direction. Uh, Dee and I spent most of the next two years down in California really running any, everywhere from the Mexican border up into Canada, uh, tracking down and, and reading about the people who were involved in the criminal enterprise that, uh, uh, that, that caused her death, the people that, uh, that were involved in that. Now, how do you feel about talking about that anymore? I'm sure it's a painful recollection. Uh, you always need, in a way, to let people know what was the impetus for you to form the organization. But um, uh, do you mind me asking a little bit about the background on this to, to fill us Not in? Not at all. We're used to we're used to talking about it. We made a decision long ago that uh, Valerie's murder had to mean something, and so that's why we have worked so hard for so long on crime-related issues. Well, what were the basic circumstances of the murder? Bob, can you tell us about it? Well, the base, basic circumstances was Val was a graduate of the San Francisco Art Institute. She had a Bachelor in Fine Arts uh, in filmmaking, and she lived down in North Beach, uh, was just getting started in, in her trade. And some guys moved into uh, the apartment house that, uh, had come, that came out of San Quentin and uh, they were really bad people and ultimately they took Valerie away and held her in a warehouse and probably because they had their way with her and, and it, it looks like the best information that we have uh, uh, both physical and circumstantial evidence is that they uh, disposed of her body up in Canada. So it was a, and it was a pretty notorious case down in, in uh, San Francisco. Uh, Dee and I woke up one morning there and here was our our faces in Valerie's picture on the Sunday edition of the San Francisco Chronicle, and it stayed there for about the next uh, 10 days or so. Now, before this happened, had you folks been publicly involved in any kind of crime-related anti-crime activities? No. No. So you became involved in the development of information and evidence in this case. And what eventually transpired as far as the case went? Well, unfortunately, nothing. We never, A, we never got Valerie's body back. Uh, B, there was never a conviction uh, uh, for her murder. Uh, the person who we are absolutely certain as are the police who did it, and in fact, we have a letter from the San Francisco police chief indicating that the person uh, was trying to bargain the, the whereabouts of Valerie's body uh, for relief of other charges against him. 
So it was, uh, this guy was a long time career criminal. So we really wound up with nothing except a pretty extensive education about how the system was not working. Uh, it was an incredible shock to us, Kevin, that the system was the way it was. And we're talking about now in 1980 and 81 in California. The, the man who murdered Valerie had uh, a nine felony convictions on his record at the time that he murdered her, including solicitation to murder, conspiracy to murder, um, uh, armed robbery, several other things. And yet he, did, he had done less than four years of time. And I mean, that was, that was the first big shock. We looked at that record and we said, how can this be? How is it that somebody with this kind of a record could be out on the street? And then ultimately when we got back here to Oregon, we found, oh yes, this is not totally uncommon. Well, as, when you came back to Oregon, uh, Didi, can you give us some idea of how you moved into getting organized, working with victims and creating this organization? Well, we, uh, we, when we came back, um, actually we were back in Oregon for um, a short time um, in 1981. Uh, and we went to a group called Parents of Murdered Children, and it was the second, I think, or, th or third meeting that that group had been together. And we met other people there who were uh, as disgruntled and dismayed with the system as we were. And finally then, in 1983, when Bob and I came back to Portland, which was our home, uh, permanently why we started going to different political meetings and um, there were about 12 people who had come from Parents Who Murdered Children who originally started Crime Victims United. Bob was the first president of the group. Uh, the first meetings were held in our house and um, we, um, one day, um, soon after that, we were at a uh, governor's uh, commission against violent crime and we heard um, Deputy DA John Bradley make a proposal for some legislation. And at that time it was three measures and we almost knocked each other down. We rushed so hard to talk with John, uh, Bob and I, to ask um, how do we get started doing this? Because we could see that through the, the issues that he was discussing, the changes he was proposing, how they would have fit in the different um, trials that we had gone to uh, down in California, how they would have fit the ones we read, the transcripts. We actually went through hundreds of cases so we could see how valuable it would be. And, and that was in 1984 then that we joined the district attorneys in a victim's rights bill that we gathered signatures for. Now that initiative did not succeed that year. It did not, no, much to our dismay. The day after it failed, we had a Crime Victims United meeting. Well, let's pause for a minute. It didn't succeed because you didn't get enough signatures to get it on the ballot. It no, wasn't voted down. No, that, no, we did get it. You did get it on signatures. the ballot. Signatures. Yes, it did not. We had a great deal of opposition. We had all kinds of trials and tribulations. We had a bad title. We had all kinds of things and we got bad press and we ended up not getting enough votes. Well, we only lost it, to, it was about 48 and a half to 51 and a half. So it was right. a very small margin of defeat. And the next day we had a Crime Victims United meeting and all of the victims said let's do it again. And Bob and I were thrilled. And that's what we did. We refiled it, we reworked it somewhat, wrote it in our living room. It truly was a victim's bill. And we, we of course, had assistance from district attorneys. And uh, that one passed, over 75% of the vote. And that's the one that passed in 1988 or 86? 86. 86. And from then on, you've been working throughout this with the legislative process. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about how that works, Bob, and, and what your interaction has been? Well, our, our experience at the legislature was, uh, to say the least, difficult, uh, Kevin. I, we, we ran into 
uh, our problem was is that we either we had one or both of the committee chairs that were were had uh, for lack of a better word I'll say a very liberal persuasion in their view of criminal justice and uh, when that happens uh, you are in big trouble as as you know now as a as a veteran legislator uh, just one experience uh, that we have we we had a proposal to amend the Oregon Constitution, Article 1, Section 15, the Reformation Clause. Over on the House side, we had managed to get a hearing on it and to get it to the floor, and we, and we had a 58 to 1 yes vote. Uh, when it went to the Senate side, uh, the, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary, though she gave us a hearing, we never got the, uh, the critical uh, chance. She never gave the, the people a chance to vote on it. So those are the kinds of problems that we consistently had. And when you say you get a hearing, that means you get to come in, you get to present it, they may ask you some questions, but you never get a work session never where the committee session. makes changes, right. approves the bill, sends right. it to the floor right. of the Senate where right. it then could be voted right. on so it can keep moving. So it got stalled in committee. It got stalled in committee. And that, that pretty much has been the history of the major pieces of legislation that we had, uh, frankly, up until this, uh, uh, this session. And uh, with some, uh, with some, ex there have been people like yourself, um, you know, people like uh, State Treasurer Jim Hill, uh, who have been staunch and and uh, supporters of ours, uh, that ha that we have turned to for help time and again on our issues. But we have faced this uh, this thing that the power of the legislat legislature legislature was not favorably disposed of what we wanted to do. So let's go back through a couple of sessions here. 89, you had uh, uh, some success with some technical changes to the criminal mm -hmm. justice laws, but you also saw the enactment of sentencing guidelines, which you opposed at the time, as I recall. I happened to have voted for it as a freshman. I recognized later it was a mistake because it took sentencing power out of the hands of the judges as to felonies, but set up a matrix system, a chart, which was very weak. And the promise was we would move up the sentences on that chart, but we never have. Or, or we've moved very little of it, I'll put it that way. But uh, following all of this, uh, how has Crime Victims United interacted with the legislature and your members as an organization? It, it, tell us a little bit more about how you meet or how people come to join the organization. Uh, Didi? I, Didi, I'll let you do that. <laughs> OK. Uh, well. Most of our long and hardest working members are victims of crime. And generally speaking, they've been more violent crimes, although that isn't true. We have some great uh, members who contribute a great deal who are lay people who don't like what's happening with criminal justice. So we have members all over the state. The last time I counted them all out there was about 800. Um, we used to send a uh, newsletter, which was easier to keep track of everyone, um, which we would like to continue doing. Uh, it was expensive and time consuming, and we need some help with it. But um, people contact us, generally speaking. We've been on various um, news programs. We've been on commissions and councils and have been um, legislative hearings and, and hearings in, oh, particularly Multnomah County where we live, um, both city and county. Now we when you say hearings, do you mean government hearings or do you mean court hearings as to particular cases or both? Well, just about all of the above. We, we, uh, we go with victims to parole uh, board upon occasion um, and we help a lot of them with um, various issues wasn't our intent we wanted to stay with with legislative issues but it doesn't seem to work that way uh, we find ourselves doing whatever it is that victims need i'm going to pause for a moment and mention to our audience that you're with us on capital insight i'm your host representative kevin mannix from salem our guests today are bob and Dee, Dee coons who are both from Crime Victims United. Dee Dee is the president, and Bob Coons is the legislative liaison. They are both essentially the leaders of this organization, and we're talking about the role and direction of Crime Victims United. 
As we go on here, Bob, you were about to add something. Yeah, I, one of the things that uh, has been a, a very difficult thing for us to overcome, because we take positions on issues and on candidates, as we very strongly support you, uh, because of that, uh, our organization is not a tax-deductible organization. And we're a nonprofit, but we are not tax-deductible. You're not a charity. Right? That's right. We're not, not a charitable organization. Uh, so when people, that makes it more difficult to collect money. Uh, when people give us money, uh, it's because they believe in what we're doing with that money. And so most of our efforts have been volunteer efforts, you know, on the part of our members and ourselves. And, uh, and that's, that's a tough way, tough way to go. And it makes us ineligible for foundation money. And so our money has to be just a donated money or out of our members' pockets. So you're a true blood and guts action group that yes. get out there and do the job. That's, that's right. right. But there's no charitable deduction no. for making a contribution. No, there's not. There's no wants sugar daddies. <laughs> okay. If someone wants to support you financially, though, send you a contribution, where would they send it? What's the address? Uh, well, send it to 6908 Southwest 37th, Portland, 97219. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to repeat it again in a moment, and then uh, I hope to remember to ask you to repeat it near the end of the show so someone might grab a pencil and write it down again. But it's 6908 Southwest 37th, Southwest 37th, Portland, 97219. 97219. Well, I hope some folks will take note of that. They can always send a contribution to Crime Victims United, and you'll use this to support the organization. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Kevin, uh, we, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we, in fact, do go out and support candidates and oppose others. Uh, and that, of course, is cut absolutely across all parties. Uh, the sexual issue, uh, sexual preference issue, uh, we have supported people who support victims, who support common sense uh, criminal justice measures, who are interested in reducing crime in this state in effective ways. And we don't care who they are or what party they're in uh, or whether they wear pants or skirts. Now, Didi, go ahead. You're going to add well, something Well, I was just going to say that uh, we take great pride in the effort that we've met, made to educate ourselves. We've gone in the prison. Uh, we've talked with uh, the Lifers Club uh, for several years. I thought we'd been saying about two years, and I just figured out it was about four. <laughs> and we've gone to McLaren, and we've talked with the intake kids, and we did that for about three years and we've gone as you know you've seen our faces out there at every possible legislative hearing and this I think is what's necessary to really get a thorough overview of Oregon's criminal justice system and who does what and how they do it and we've made that effort. Aren't you two really among the few along with perhaps Steve Dole who, uh, who is also with Crime Victims United, uh, the, among the few who actually lobby the legislature on behalf of victims as opposed to all the other interests or groups out there? I, well, I think so. Uh, there have been uh, a mother, uh, organizations like Mother Against Drunk Driving who come down and lobby the legislature on very, very specific issues that pertain only to their particular issue. Uh, we lobby the legislature on behalf. Our idea is, is that if you're serious about victimization, the idea is you want less victims. That's, that's at, at the basis of our point of view. And so if you accept that as being a, a sensible thing to do, then it means that you have to become familiar with policy issues across the board in how we run and operate our criminal justice system. And uh, we would say, as, as you know, Kevin, that uh, we don't think that we have done a very good job of that. You mean the system or your own organization? <laughs> uh, we don't think uh, the system is operating uh, the way it ought to operate and that uh, our policies have been really wrong-headed. Well, let's talk about the initiative process in 1994 when uh, I came out with measures 11, well, 10, 11, and 17. Um, 10 was the uh, initiative that said uh, if the citizens pass a criminal sentence, 
that the legislature can only reduce it with a two-thirds vote to sort of serve as a, as a boost to any initiative uh, on, on criminal sentencing. 11 is the mandatory minimums for violent crime, and 17 is the prison work measure that says prisoners in the state prison system need to be working full time. And it allows, of course, for basic education. It allows for drug and alcohol rehabilitation. It also allows for on-the-job training, all as part of the work component. But uh, when those measures came up, uh, what was your reaction to that, and, 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 and how, how did your organization interact with those? Didi, you want to start off? Well, we endorsed them. Uh, we, uh, some of our members collected signatures for them, and um, Bob and I have discussed this, and we feel strongly that a good share of the very important changes that have come about would not have had there not been about Measure 11. Um, I think the, the changes in the juvenile system have uh, come about because of that. Was this because of the ripple effect that is ballot Measure 11 also said that 15, 16, and 17 year olds who are charged with these listed violent crimes uh, would be tried in adult court, although they could then be held in a juvenile facility at the state level, mm -hmm. but they'd be tried in adult court. Is that one of the ripple effects? People have finally said, whoops, we better reform the juvenile system then because look what's happening here? Well, those, those changes had been attempted through the legislative process and had not been successful. And so I think once they were by the vote of the people, then that did cause that rippling effect that mm -hmm. they knew the legislator as a body knew that they had to address these these issues then. I, I think 11 and 17 uh, really changed the terms of the debate. Uh, and, uh, and, and what it highlights, and is, and is highlighting even more to, to this very day, uh, is uh, unfortunately a vast difference between where the big majority of the people of this state are, how they would like to have their criminal justice system operated, and unfortunately, were many of the officials who are responsible for the criminal justice system. And uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the, 11, the Senate Bill 1145 debate that uh, was carried on here just a few months ago in the special session is, is a classic example of that. And, um, and uh, we That all debate was about community corrections in the state doing right. a partnership with the counties, but also then who spends money on what and uh, right. is it cost effective and the right. counties are going to have to take some of the state prisoners as part of receiving state right. funds. But go ahead, I just wanted to try to... Well, I, I think that in, in our view, uh, and we, were, we worked very hard to try and be informed on this issue. In our view, I think that, that six, seven years down the line, we're going to look back and we're going to look at Senate Bill 1145 in the same with the same dismay that we looked at the decision to cap uh, McLaren and Hillcrest. Uh, we were involved in the fight to not have that done. Uh, and it was a bloody slug and match just like the 1145 was. We lost the war or that, that mm -hmm. battle. Uh, and now when you talk to the people who are involved with the issue, they look back upon that as being a really bad decision that we made. Most people are now saying that. Now the cap on McLaren was saying that 513 mm -hmm. juveniles at most could be kept in this state institution That's right. for juvenile criminals. Right. Uh, and, as a, and the theory was, well, this will force us to deal with juveniles at the county level. Mm -hmm. But in practice, it just meant that the counties didn't, couldn't send their worst offenders anymore to the state unless the state released some other bad offenders. So things backed up in the county level, and then they ran out of facilities and programs to deal with the lesser juvenile offenders because they had to keep holding on to the worst juvenile offenders who couldn't go on to the state. Sort of like a sewage system backup or a water system backup. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sewage system is really good. <laughs> it's a good analogy. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm fearful, uh, and I think most of us who worked on that are very fearful, that, that essentially what we did with 1145 is to put a cap on the adult system. Um, and to, you're going to see a backup that's going to occur that will overwhelm some of the counties, particularly more populous counties like Marion County, Multnomah County, Washington, Clackamas. Uh, and I think, that, uh, I, I think that we will look back five, six, seven years from now and say, boy, did we make a big mistake. When you say put a cap on the adult system, it's because certain felony uh, offenders who normally would have gone into the state prison system have to be dealt with at the county level. And, uh, and I assume that means, too, that unless the state puts up the resources, they'll end up being released at the county level. That's right. 
and there's no actual cap in the number of felons otherwise, no. but we're diverting some of them into the counties now. Right. And that's the concern, well, I assume. Yes. What we've been doing ever since, oh, actually in the 70s, but certainly through the 80s in the state, all of these, these issues that we have uh, passed, all of these measures and what have you, that have allowed uh, criminals to uh, what it really does is it just makes more criminals in the community. Like the sentencing guidelines, for instance. We took the lowest time, 1986, which was just about the, the shortest sentencing time and the least amount of offenders being incarcerated. We took that as the standard for the sentencing guidelines, did a study, then extended the, the sentence just a little longer for the most violent offenders, murders, rapists, what have you, but only about 12% of people who were convicted of felony crimes were going to the prison system, the state system at all. The rest of them were staying in the community. Well, we didn't have enough jails in the community to be able to incarcerate them. So what they were was in the community. That's what we've done again with 1145. All right, and the concern is that we're not addressing accountability. That is, the state has to be accountable for accountability, and the, the prisoner has to be held accountable, the criminal, for having committed a crime. Now, on property crimes, we have got an initiative circulating right now that would say we're going to have some accountability for the most serious property criminals, arsonists, burglars, auto thieves, those who steal over $10,000 and those who um, do more than $10,000 worth of damage to property. And it says, instead of probation on the first conviction, that we would presume a sentence of 18 months. Um, uh, the judge could still take it down for special reasons to probation, but would start out assuming it's going to be 18 months. Then we say a second conviction, it's a mandatory minimum. Two years, mandatory minimum, no release, no good time, or whatever else. Um, how do you feel about that kind of approach? Well, we, I'm, I'm hardly in favor of it, and I think it's a very modest approach, uh, even though to listen to many of the people who presently operate the system, you'd think that it is absolutely the damnation bow-wows that is befallen the state. Uh, it is not. And the, and the, the question that, that Didi and I have, have tried to raise over and over again, Kevin, is why can't Oregon learn to incarcerate people at a far lesser cost than what we're doing. And that issue has never been addressed uh, until we got to the 1145 debate. And as you know, we had uh, uh, people come here from Texas uh, uh, to uh, show us that what their uh, plan was and what their costs were. Uh, far less than what About a fourth of what Oregon's About are. a fourth of what we're So at. this is still a pending issue for us to deal with. Absolutely. It's the question of operating and constructing prisons in Oregon. Why does it cost so much? An issue which I would hope we can delve into this summer. We only have a minute left, and I'd like to get back to the address for Crime Victims United, which is? <laughs> 6908 Southwest 37th, Portland 97. Two one nine. Good. And the other thing is there's a victims' rights initiative that we're yes. circulating right now, yes. and that'll give victims of crime the right to be notified about proceedings, the right to be present. Are you folks working on that? Yes. Yes, we're gathering signatures for that, and, and that what it does is it, it, uh, it places some of those rights that we, we got in the statute in 1986, moves them over into the Constitution. So Very the good. victims, for the first time, will have constitutional rights in the state of Oregon. Just like yeah. criminals. Just like criminals. Okay, well, with that, we've run out of time on the program today. I thank both of you for joining us, and I thank our audience for joining us with Bob and Dee Dee Coons from Crime Victims United. We hope to see you again next time. Thanks very much.